Welcome to Unapologetically Sensitive, where you can learn, relate, laugh, and maybe even live a bolder, brighter life. I'm your host, Patricia Young. This is a weekly podcast where we explore the strengths we have because of our sensitivity and some of the challenges it poses as well. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hey there. To the creatives, healers, sensitives, and deep thinkers, welcome. How are you? Today's guest and episode, I think you're really going to enjoy. I'm speaking with Kathy McCrane. We talk about her experience taking the online HSP course, but even if you know that you don't want to take it, even if you've already taken it, we talk about a lot of common themes that come up for neurodivergent people, for HSPs, around reluctance to join groups, around being seen, what we can expect when we're around other people. I think I said the resistance that comes up. We talk about often we have negative thoughts or feelings before we do something, the things that prevent us from expanding in our life, ways that we can work with those automatic negative thoughts and looking at the possibilities. I don't know. I think even if you know that you don't want to take the course or you've taken it, I think there's some good stuff in here, but I'm going to let you decide about that. Let me tell you a little bit about Kathy. Kathy McGrain, MA, is a lover of books, Scrabble, Spanish, Chinese tea, music, silence, being, good conversation, good food, naps, walks, and gentle hikes. She's lived in Colombia, South America, Spain, Colorado, and Texas on the U.S.-Mexican border. She's originally from Iowa and has lived now in Illinois for 20 plus years. She works as an academic advisor at a community college. I have a deep appreciation for Kathy's insights, and I never know what people are going to say when we talk about taking the course. I also talk about some ways that I see things showing up just in general, whether it's about taking the course or not. So like I said, I, I think there's some good stuff in here regardless, but I'll let you decide. And now on to the show. Hey, Kathy, how are you? I'm great. Glad to be here this morning. I'm excited to have this conversation. It's always interesting to do these because you and I don't talk about how the group was for you or what your experience was. So I'm always genuinely curious to know. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me, why did you even decide to take the online HSP course? Well, I had listened to the podcast, and so that was kind of my introduction to knowing about the group, and I like the podcast a lot. I think I was looking for like-minded folks, mm -hmm. because as an HSP, I feel alone a lot of times, because I don't run around with a lot of HSPs here, so... Mm -hmm. That was my main motivation, I think. Mm -hmm. And then you signed up for the course and then let me know that you probably weren't going to be taking the course. Right. Right. And I don't remember. I think that was due to some, some of my family circumstances and things like mm -hmm. that. And I just wasn't sure if it was going to be a good time. And then it ended up working out, which was great. Right. Right. What were you hoping to get from the group? I hear that you wanted to be with other HSPs. Was there anything else that you were hoping for? Well, I think wanting to be with HSPs wasn't just a social type of gathering. I, I was wanting, I think, to deepen my comfort as an HSP, having heard the podcast and feeling more comfortable and confident mm -hmm in who I am, I think learning how to be in the world as an HSP, even though obviously I've been doing it for a long time, learning sure, learning how to do that in ways that are kinder to myself and more supportive of myself. Oh, I love that. Were there any fears or concerns that you had before starting the group or maybe the first group? What was coming up for you? Anything? Yeah, I think my fears were that I, that I wouldn't like people in the group, that, that we mm -hmm. wouldn't get along, that I would be odd woman out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, who hasn't experienced yeah, that? Yeah, and that, I mean, honestly, that I was spending a chunk of change on this and was it going to be a good experience? So Sure, sure. 
I think all those things are natural and I'm very reluctant to join groups for that same reason. Are they going to get me? Is the facilitator going to get me? I mean, if you've listened to earlier episodes, I was in a mastermind and I was ejected from the group from sharing a concern. I've had lots of experiences where I feel like, boy, that was a mistake. And so I'm very reluctant to join groups so I can understand if somebody's singing like, oh, should I, shouldn't I? That is a hard thing. What was it that helped you move beyond that fear? I think it was the possibility of what could happen. And Mm -hmm. that if nothing else, it would be a learning experience for me. Mm -hmm. And I trusted that the content of the videos, et cetera, would be good. Having listened to you and Jen, I was, I knew that would be good. So yeah, Mm -hmm. I just, I decided to go for it. Yeah. I often find myself that if I'm having fears about something like, oh, what if I don't fit in? What if I don't belong? What if they don't get me? I often have to go like, what if it works? What if I find people that I like? What if it ends up being the best thing in the world? I'm not saying that it will be, but I often have to challenge those. I think just the way that our brains are wired, we tend to go to that most fearful, most protective space. It makes us great troubleshooters, problem solvers, forecasters but it often is not super helpful in helping us expand our lives because of that automatic protective nature. That's a really good way to reframe it, isn't it? Thinking about Mm -hmm. what if things do go right? What if this is wonderful? Because my brain doesn't go there automatically. So I appreciate that reminder this morning. That's great. Sure. Well, it's interesting. I was just, I think I was talking to Jen yesterday that (laughs) we can't get an episode by without me talking about my kayak. And so it's summertime again, although it's gloomy here. We're doing skills practice and rolling again. And we had skills practice Saturday and Pat, whom if you're a longtime listener, you know, I adore Pat. He's in his 70s. He's just the most kindest, loving, gentlest, patient person. And he said, are you going to skills? We had a text exchange. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't want to get my hair wet. The water's still cold. It's overcast. And I decided to go, but was very reluctant. And He's like, do you want to do some practice? And I didn't want to. I didn't want to go. I didn't want to practice. And we did. And I really enjoyed it. And I was saying, I just wonder if that's part of how my brain is wired, that it's more common for me to not get excited and to have more resistance about things. What I've learned is I just have to show up. Like, I have to let the resistance be okay. So I said, I wasn't like, woohoo, I'm all in. But you know, I allowed myself to have the resistance and to show up and I brought my equipment and said, I don't have to use the mask and goggles. I don't have to get my hair wet. I don't have to get my head wet. I don't have to do anything. And we did a little bit of skills practice. And again, I I don't know if that's trauma. I don't know if that's just how we're wired. But if I go based on how I feel about things, I probably would leave the house once every few months and that would be it. And I just know to show up. And if I get there and I don't like it, I can always turn around and leave. And I always have to remind myself that If I go on, I don't like it. I don't have to stay. I can leave. I don't have to do any of the permanent. But there's, I would honestly say that the majority of my experience is not like I'm so excited and I just can't wait to go and be there. (laughs) I know. And then it's easy to judge myself because I'm not feeling that excitement or that enthusiasm. And it's like, well, I don't know. And instead of just saying, well, let's give this a try. Right, right. My hope is in sharing that, that that normalizes it for more people because. I used to, I want to get back to our questions, but I used to go on vacation and someone very close to me would say like, I hope you have a magnificent time. I hope it's fabulous. I hope it's amazing. And it made me feel terrible because traveling often brings up anxiety and the uncertainty and all of these unknowns. And so I have a a close friend who would say, since I don't swear on the podcast, I'm thinking of a rhymey word. She'd say, have a bitty time, but it starts with HS. (laughs) And I felt like it can't get any worse than that. And so anything that happens is going to be better. So we would joke and say, you know, have a bitty time. (laughs) And that really helped to take that expectation of whatever happens, happens. And I think we often do this thing where probably because we feel things deeply and we think about things deeply and we have this protective nature that it's not uncommon for us to not be giddy and excited about new things because we've often been othered, we don't fit in. And so why would I be excited about showing up to a group of people where that may happen again? Yeah. And I'm thinking even about meditation, right? Like if you're meditating or mindfulness, whatever you're doing, 
that I would meditate sometimes and my significant other would say, oh, how was your meditation? Or do you have a good meditation today? And I'm like, what's a good meditation? Because I was showing up as who I was. So yeah, there were things about right. it that were really good, but there were also moments of boredom or discomfort. So I think we have to remember to embrace all of it. And, and that's not necessarily what we're taught in this society. Right. And I think that's a big part of the group that we talk about. You can have your camera off, you can be in bed, if you need to eat, if you need to get up and go to the bathroom, that everybody has different needs and allowing for us to show up fully and authentically how we are, I think is one of the biggest gifts. And I, I had plans to go out to dinner with a friend and I was really tired and very low energy, but I thought, you know, I can show up how I am. And historically, I would have canceled if I couldn't get my stuff together and be happy and bright and energetic and talk about all the positive things. And when we allow ourselves to be authentic to ourselves and we find our people where we can show up exactly how we are, man, that is so nice to have that connection and not having to withdraw when we're not doing well and to kind of do our own healing alone and then go back into society when we feel better, that when we can have people around us, when we choose to, no matter what we're feeling, man, that's powerful. And that was one of the great things about the group was that we could we could show up no matter what was going on. And I really appreciated that. Can you say a little bit more about how that if that was for you or if you saw that with someone else so that listeners kind of get a sense of like, hmm, what does she mean by that? Well, I think for myself, I think I have fibromyalgia. And so there are times after work, especially when I'm tired or my body is hurting or there's been just a lot going on and I'm not in a great place. And just to be able to talk about that and not feel like I have to hide what's going on mm -hmm. to be, be there and be cheerful and act like, oh, nothing's going on. I think that was wonderful. And I think our group, one of the things I really appreciate about our group is that we're there for each other no matter what's going on with somebody. So I felt not only by you, but by others seen and heard and I felt compassion. And mm -hmm. so it was really kind of a sweet space. Have you experienced that before in your life, having people being able to really be present for you when you're struggling, especially having that comorbidity of fibro? I have a close friend who lives halfway across the country and, and a couple of other people, but to experience that in a group I have not. That was something mm. new. I was trying to think this morning, when did your group officially end? Do you recall? Was it the beginning of May? No, or was that the, no, was it April? And then we extended into May. I, I don't remember. I think you're right. I think it was April that we ended and then your group chose to extend five weeks, but there were two weeks in there where we didn't meet. So we went through part of June and then yeah. had our last group meeting. Yeah. And then you all have decided to continue meeting as a group. Yeah, yeah. We had our first meeting last week as a group, and that was great. And we text back and forth a lot. Sometimes it's really mm -hmm. to support somebody who's going through maybe a new experience. Like you mentioned, someone trying something that maybe is outside of their comfort zone, and they're not sure if it's good or not. And... So mm -hmm. someone even texting during that experience and us being able to offer some support. Sometimes we, we text about what's going on in our daily lives or, and we of course are kind of crazy. We text about crystals and mm -hmm. oracle decks and tarot cards that just are ways to look at our lives. So we have a lot of fun with that. Mm -hmm. And what I recall, and I'm not part of your group and never have been, but for some people, they're not on their phones a lot. For some people, the notifications of getting texts feels too overstimulating. So I know at least one person decided to turn their notifications off. I'm saying this to say that not everybody loves texting. Not everybody loves the frequency of texting, but everybody has had the opportunity to show up in ways that work for them. And it's not that everybody is on the same level or same need of frequency and duration of communication. No, and we're not all on the same amount every day. Like when I'm at work, there may be other people texting back and forth and I have my texts off for the group. Mm -hmm. 
but I'll pick up my phone and I'll see that there's been a bunch of texting about this, or I might see it'll be a really interesting thread and I'll drop in. So I think people feel comfortable being there as much as they're comfortable. And I think if someone has not been there for three or four days, we feel like we want to check in and just make sure everything's going okay. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's been really good. But it's not, mm -hmm. there are some of us who text more often and others who will kind of drop in maybe once a day and just kind of read everything that's going on and then offer some feedback. But there's not, mm -hmm. not an expectation there. Yeah. There's also, I was trying to figure out in my head what I thought the age span was. There's probably a good 35 years from the youngest to the oldest. Do you know? Yeah, close to that. At least 30. Yeah. 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 So the group is very different. I think that there are two people that are closer in age and have the same, a closer need for communication. I think there are a couple of people that are a little bit older, have a different need for communication. But y'all have been able to navigate that. It looks like pretty well from me observing on the outside. Yeah. Yeah, because I think we have 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s yeah. in our group. And we talk about how different we are, mm -hmm. and yet how when we get together, how well we connect. Mm -hmm. And just reminding each other about self-care. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. Do you recall the first group, how you felt when we did meet? Yeah, I think I was apprehensive. Very normal. <laughs> probably a little bit excited, but I think the apprehensive was maybe overriding that a little bit, kind of like, oh, I'm going to check this out. Mm -hmm. And I remember you mentioning that it was normal to kind of have, what did you call it? Like a vulnerability hangover, hangover after the mm -hmm. first meeting. And I remember that. Because I remember being invited to share, and then afterwards it was like, oh my gosh, I don't even know these people. Did I say too much? What are they going to think of me? Yep, exactly. Did I share so, too much? Did I make enough eye contact? Did I listen to other people? And yeah. these are these are my gremlins. I'm not saying these are yours. Yeah. But that's part of what goes on of what did they think of me? Was that too much? Am I too much? Do I fit in? I mean, all those things are normal. And am I going to connect with right. these people? And it was interesting because there were some people that I kind of felt like that immediate mm -hmm. connection with. And then there were other connections that came over time in kind of surprising mm -hmm. ways. But I feel connected with everybody in yeah. our group. Yeah. And what often happens, I'm, I'm trying to think of, I think I can share this. So one of the people in your group is also a client of mine, actually more than one, but I'm just going to say one for right now. And in our private sessions, often things would come up for this person in group that had nothing to do with the group member, nothing to do with the group member, their dynamics. And what we don't heal, we bring to situations. And the gift is that it had nothing to do with the group member, but because we were working together and this person recognized that, they recognized that their feelings and responses, like this kind of seems weird. And so I'm bringing that up because often it does take us time to get to know people or we meet somebody like, ooh, you remind me of someone that, <laughs> you know, and then if we stay open and yeah. get to see like, oh, this is not that, that can make a difference. Yeah. 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 And I think one of the things that you brought up, especially as we continue to work a little bit after the end of the group was creating a space where we can let one another know if we're uncomfortable with something. Mm -hmm. And I felt comfortable doing that with somebody one-on-one. -on -one. And I was like, I don't know how this person is going to respond. But, but it was a very lovely exchange. Mm. So, I, yeah, I felt heard and received and was reminded what a lovely person this, this person is. So, so I appreciate that. Oh, that excites me when I hear that. That... Although we do work on communication in the group because your group did extend, we talked about what are the challenges that come up and what I've seen come up with groups that extend without having facilitation is little things start to rub people the wrong way and they don't have a way to talk about it and the dynamic can get out of balance. I'm not saying it happens for every group. This is just my observation. And so to hear that you were able to take that and have enough trust in the relationship and your ability to communicate and have what 
could have been a scary discussion with someone to go like, oh, this works. When we are dealing with yeah. people that have skill sets and want to have intimacy and we take that risk, then there's almost just like, oh, I can do this. Yeah. Yeah. And that felt really good. Yeah. Oh, that's so exciting to hear. Have you been in other groups before and how did this group compare to other groups? I, I know that there's not another group like this, but just in general, is that, can you speak to that? I don't know if I have been on other groups online that have been this interactive. Mm -hmm. I think I have done other things online. I've taken some meditation type things mm -hmm. with Tara Brock, who I like a lot. Mm -hmm. And I've been involved in learning type activities, but... I think what I appreciated about this group was that we were interactive and mm -hmm. I felt like there were two different threads weaving through our group. And one was the videos and the prepared materials, which we watched outside of class, mm -hmm. which I loved. And then the other was the actual process we had as a group. And I feel like the process is what was different about this from other experiences. Because we would talk about what we had learned in the video sometimes, but we would also talk about whatever was up for one another. And so I think right. having that facilitated process was very valuable. I think group work can be really tricky. I'm having a gremlin, but I'm going to say what I'm going to say anyways. If you don't have a facilitator that knows how to manage groups and hasn't worked on their own stuff and being able to have people talk about what's going on in the moment. And at the first group, we talk about how do you want this group to go? And do you want to focus strictly on the material? Do you want to bring whatever's going on in your life? My experience is when the group is allowed to bring whatever they want to the group, we cover all of the topics. It may not be in the week that we're talking about it, but like you said, I think we have this need to be seen and heard and it can really be valuable to have that facilitation so that we can talk about things, but somebody's there to kind of keep the threads together if there are little bumps that come up to show what the biases are. Because we did have a couple of, in my mind, I don't know that I would call them hiccups, but some people had some things going on that either could have been, I'm struggling with my language because I'm imagining like, this person listening and feeling like it's judgmental, just allowing everybody to be where they were at and to still have group cohesion and honoring that people were in a different place and that there was room for everybody to show up how they needed to show up. Yeah, I think having a facilitator made it a safe place initially while we were still getting to know each other. Sure. And I think... One of the other things you talked about was even though we are sometimes processing our own stuff that we did cover all the topics. And mm -hmm. I think that was really helpful because then it wasn't just theoretical knowledge, but it was like, yeah, I'm dealing with this in my real life. And it's like, oh, that's a boundary issue. Or I think one time I shared something and you said something about perfectionism. And as I was, you know, looking over my notes Perfectionism was a big thing is a big thing for me. And I think I don't know if it was you or Jen, but somewhere in the notes about I have a quote about ending self violence. That's Jen. <laughs> I think the tendency to be violent against ourselves and our thoughts, mm -hmm. not in actions, but with the inner critic is really strong. Mm -hmm. And I would never have thought of that as self-violence. I would have just thought of that as, oh, you know, get it, keeping myself motivated. And right. so I think that was a really helpful thing to keep in mind. And I keep coming back to that. So yeah. And that can look like, I can't believe I did that. Why wasn't I thinking? Ugh, I should have remembered. I can't can't believe I forgot that. I don't know. Why did I say that? Those are all self-violent thoughts as opposed to, ooh. Or yeah, or sitting in my chair, relaxing and thinking, get up, you lazy person. You need mm -hmm. to go do this right now. Clean or do whatever when really what my body needs is to relax. Yeah. We often have this idea that if we punish ourselves or are mean to ourselves, that's how we motivate ourselves. And this fear of 
if I allow myself to rest, I'm never going to get anything done. And I've yes. really been struggling with tasks recently. And this morning, I don't know what happened, but I started to take care of things that I haven't been able to do for quite some time. And I've just gotten to the place where I mostly trust. It's hard when things start piling up. There's that part of me that goes like, ugh, what the heck? And when I trust my rhythms, I naturally come back into it. And there's so much less suffering because you know, I think about being in college and probably how many bags of M&Ms I ate before writing a paper while I was procrastinating. And I wasn't the type of person that cleaned the house in the meantime. So I really didn't have a lot to show for <laughs> you know, my fear of not of struggling with transitions and getting things started. Yeah. You know. How was it being in a group with other HSPs? What was unexpected or surprised you? Anything? I think the way we all had such similar experiences, even though we're very different people, mm -hmm. that I could talk about something and Patricia, you would say, how many other people have felt X, Y, or Z? And most of us would raise our hands. Mm -hmm. So that felt really affirming to me and surprising that this just wasn't something that was quote unquote wrong with me. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's another important thing about the class is I think so many of us have grown up because we're different from others feeling that there's something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. And I think this was a really good place to begin to challenge that, that mm -hmm. pattern. Mm -hmm. And, and see also what our, what our strengths are, right? Mm -hmm. I think I even felt affirmed in the group. I don't think I've talked about this, but just sometimes I would notice something going on in somebody else's face mm -hmm. or other dynamics. And I would be able to say, hey, how are you doing? And I could feel the look of relief on that other person's face. And so... I think that's probably something I do as an academic advisor too, but, mm -hmm. but that felt very affirming for me. Yeah, yeah. I'm always surprised at how similar and different HSPs are, that there was that commonality and you all are very different, have different backgrounds, different ways of showing up, and there's this beauty in finding connection and there are differences. Yeah, and I think... I think that feeling of connection among differences is so important because I think that's what so many of us as HSPs are longing for is we've got a lot of people we can communicate and kind of on a surface level, but for people who really value that deeper communication and sense of connection, there's not a lot of places you go to find that as an yeah. HSP. And I think most of us, many, some, I don't know, I'd, I'd love to know what you're qualifier is really have that longing to be seen and heard and understood and to have my unique experience. It feels like I am the only one for somebody to go like, yeah, I hear you. I get it. I see you. I hear you. You don't even have to have the same experience, but just that sense of I'm not weird. There's nothing wrong with me. You're not judging me. You're not going to other me. Right. And I think there are other people in our lives who may say that, like, I see you or I get you or whatever. Mm -hmm. But to be in a place where people truly do get you and, and to feel that is is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I was thinking as long as I've taught these courses, I think it's going on four years now. I find that I'm less and less hands-on and really step back and allow the group to have their process and to step in when I need to. When I first started, I think it was very, I think I thought I had to be very hands-on and very in there. And as time goes on, so I, I often get this sense of imposter syndrome of like, am I doing any good in these groups? And I'm not involved enough because for me, that's what love and caring looks like. I'm there and I'm interacting and I'm talking. And I really took a step back and it seems like it's working. But it is interesting. Yeah, I'm wondering if just like you've done it enough, so you kind of are able to trust the process mm -hmm. now that you've created trust the container and then just trust that you'll know kind of flowing in and out is, as needed. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's great. Yeah, just interesting. What's a takeaway that you got from the course? I know that's, I hate when people ask me this question. So if you don't want to answer it, I'd be like, yeah. 
I think the takeaway that I haven't fully embodied or internalized yet is that there's nothing wrong with me. Mm, That's a big one. That there's nothing wrong with me and my way of being. So I feel like the the course left me with a lot of a lot of things to keep working on that I already was wo- working on, but gave me deeper focus. Mm-hmm. And so I think self trust, mm. trusting myself, and honoring myself. Being okay with all of my emotions Mm. because we as HSPs tend to have so many of those and they don't always wrap up in nice packages. Sure. And that there are people I can connect with out there. Those are some pretty huge takeaways. Yeah. Yeah. Very grateful. That's pretty significant. If someone was thinking about taking the course and they're like, uh, I don't know. I I don't fit in. I don't like groups. It's a lot of money. I don't know. Anything you would say to them? I would say this is going to be a risk because anything new is a risk. Mm -hmm. But you might just find those people that you can connect with. And even if you don't, you might get to experience being seen and heard and Mm -hmm. valued. And you might learn to trust yourself a little bit more. I think for someone who is newer as an HSP, the videos are invaluable. I think for me as someone who's known she's an HSP, I still have a notebook full of notes to myself based on those videos because they may be things I've heard before, but to actually internalize it and live it is, is another experience. It's Mm. kind of like, I was looking at Elaine Aaron's books this morning. Mm -hmm. And I opened up just the basic book, I don't remember what it's called, but the blue cover. And there was a whole chapter on something that I know I've read before. But I hadn't remembered reading that. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so tying in with what I'm experiencing right now. And Mm -hmm. the videos are great because you and Jen are sharing from your real life experience. And then we get to take those into our real life experience. Mm. It's funny, it's been so long since I've watched the videos and Jen and I made those probably four years ago. Yeah, I would bet. They w- you would look back at them and find some really interesting things. Yeah. I've watched yeah. a couple of the beginning ones. And when I talked to Jen about it, she's like, we can redo them. And I don't think they need to be redone. I think that they're good. You definitely get to see. <laughs> I shouldn't say this, but just I'm aging, changing that, that those things are reflected also. And that's okay. Aren't we all? Yep. Yep. And I would not have said that, Patricia. I would not have said looking at the earlier one and looking at them now, looking at you now, I would not have said you've aged. Oh, I would say I would say your hair is longer. I yeah. would say maybe you're even more comfortable in your own skin. So those are things that I would say seeing you now and seeing you then. Oh, thanks, Kathy. Yes, on the precipice of turning 60, by the time you hear this, I will be 60, 60 spins around the whatever the right thing to say is, it means that I'm 60. <laughs> I'm going to be, I'm going to be 59 in August. So yeah. Yeah. I love getting older. I just feel like I'm so much more relaxed and comfortable in who I am. And I'm too tired to be as hung up as I was about some other things. So I was just talking with a friend about, I have an area of my life that's complicated and difficult and it's challenging. And she was saying, you know, she admires what I learned from it. And I said, be careful of what you ask for because the universe gave me some pretty uncomfortable lessons to really get to the point where it's okay if people don't like me, it's okay if people don't see how I see myself, that people exclude me, that people don't, you know, I'm, I'm on the outer skirts in some activities and people have no sense of who I am. And, and I've just had to learn to be okay with that. And as uncomfortable as it's been, there's been some freedom in it, just going like, mm, 
Not to say I don't get activated sometimes, not to say that I don't have feelings about it, but it does not dysregulate me the way that it did when all of this stuff happened in the past. It just took me out and now I'm like, mm, I'm just not for everybody. Yeah. And everybody's not for me. Right. And that's that's a big thing too, I think is if someone doesn't greet me, for example, on a regular basis, I would used to go out of my way to greet that person any, anyway. And, you know, after a while, I thought, if it's not a mutual thing, and it's been going on for quite a while, it's okay to take care of myself. And I don't wish any harm to that person. But I'm not going to put a lot of energy into that. Yeah. We often spend so much time wondering if people are going to choose us. Am I okay? Am I enough? Do they like me? Are they going to want to get together with me again? It's like, do I like them? Do I want to get together right. with them again? Right. That we're the ones that right. get to choose. Right. Yeah. And I, I was thinking specifically about the workplace, but I think there even it's becoming comfortable with who I am and the way I do things and trusting that, that that's okay, even though other people may may look at you and say, really? And you're like, yeah, I'm like, yeah, really? Yeah, yeah. So, Kathy, without discussing specific content, in the beginning of the course, there were some things that you shared with me privately about yourself that you wanted to share with the group, but were concerned because you may be the only one. So again, without sharing content, how has that been now that we've gone through the group and some extra time? How do you feel about those things? Because I my recollection is like, ooh, I don't, I don't know about this. I feel very different because of these things. Yeah. So I think I was able to talk about it in the group, which felt good, and everybody was just fine with it. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've processed it a lot with the group since then, just because it is my experience, which is kind of different. But I think if I needed to, that I, that I could, mm -hmm. that I could talk about it. Yeah. 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 I think it was a safe place. Good. Good. Glad to hear that. And just because you take the course, it's not a final destination that by the time you take this course, you will be complete in your growth and learning about being highly sensitive, how you're wired. It's a tool for connecting and learning more about yourself. And as Jen and I always say, as long as you're alive, there will be struggles, there will be challenges, there will be joys, there will be times of ease, but it's not like take this course and you will no longer experience blah, 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 because that's just a crock of... Wouldn't that be great, Patricia, if that were it? If it were that I want easy, that. You, you, could, you could charge a million dollars for that class. No, but I appreciate that about the podcast, right? That I get to see you and Jen in process. Mm-hmm. And I think seeing one another in process is part of what we do in group and yeah. lets us know we're not alone and lets us know or reminds those of us who are perfectionists that it's okay not to have it all figured out. Yeah, yeah. And maybe just being able to come back into the moment, the yeah. present moment. Yeah. Kathy, we need to wrap up. Is there anything that I didn't ask you about or anything that you want to share that we didn't talk about that feels important? No, I think just I'll mention you asked uh, at one point, like, would the videos on their own mm -hmm. have been as effective as so if someone wanted to just do the videos? And I think the videos are great for learning about being an HSP and giving some very helpful tools. Mm -hmm. And so they were wonderful. I think for somebody just watching the videos, you would miss out on the richness of the group experience and the affirmation of who I am as an a HSP. And that's what I really valued about the course was, mm. was being able to be a part of that group. I really appreciate you saying that because I had forgotten when I went into live in residential treatment back in my 30s, the biggest thing that I got from that was learning what it was like to live in a functional environment with functional rules and functional adults that taught us how to work out conflict and how to talk about if we had a resident that ended up leaving because they broke the rules that we talked about that in group. And it was so 
helpful to me. And that's one of the reasons that I love doing groups is teaching people. Really, we recreate a family of origin that has healthy functional rules with boundaries and with respect and knowing that it's okay to talk about things and inviting people to share what their perceptions were, where maybe in our family of origins, we're like, we don't talk about that or everything's fine, where we do talk about things that are going on. Are you noticing that something was going on with somebody and making room and space so that we get the experience of what it's like to be in a functional relationship? So we know that that's what we can be expecting outside of the group. And if we've never experienced that before, have had it in very limited ways, it really can model the possibility of what is available that we should be experiencing. Yeah. 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 It's almost like being, not to be too woo-woo, but it's almost like being energetically held mm -hmm. while in that space. And yeah. it's, it's, it's very nice. Yeah. I think everybody wants that. To feel like we can show up and be who we are in whatever state and somebody's going to be present for us and hold space for us. I don't think that's woo at all. Yeah. Kathy, thank you so much for being here today. It's, it's always exciting to hear what people's perceptions are because we don't really talk about it in group and you've had time to process after group and then we did the after group and then there were a few, two weeks in a row where y'all met without me so you had a chance to kind of try it out on your own. I love to hear that things are going well, but it's always interesting to hear your perspective. So thank you for yeah. sharing. Thanks, this was fun. Yeah. All right, anything else before we go? No. All right. Thank you, Kathy. Have a great day. Thank you. Have a great day. Hey again. So I'm wondering how that was for you. If you are interested in learning more about the online HSP course, the best thing to do is to go to my website at unapologeticallysensitive.com. There's a tab for the HSP groups page. There are tons of episodes of other people that have taken the course. There are one minute clips. There's some video clips. If you scroll down, it talks about each of the modules and the things that we talk about in each module for those of you that love information like I do. In the online HSP course, it's 10 weeks long. We're, I'm gonna limit it to eight members, which is a really nice size. I think Kathy's group was smaller, maybe five or six. I've had groups as big as 12. It really works and the dynamic is different. The topics that we cover are mindfulness and self-compassion, turning negative messages into strengths, perfectionism, embracing our emotions, self-care is non-negotiable, boundaries, communication, authenticity, and vulnerability, and creating a lifestyle that honors the HSP. I think these are really powerful groups. You can decide yourself. Brass tacks. The course will start Monday, September 11th, and it's going to go either through November 13th or November 20th. It's 10 weeks, but we may have a week in there. The time will be from three o'clock to 4.20 Pacific Standard Time. So make sure that you calculate if you're not in Pacific Standard Time. Registration will start August 16th for early bird registration and go to August 22nd. And then regular registration will go from August 23rd to August 30th. And all the information, the pricing is on my website. This is for the year 2023. If you have any questions, feel free to go to my website at unapologeticallysensitive.com. There's a contact sheet that you can fill out that helps me know what time zone you're in and some good times to reach out to you. These groups have been incredibly powerful. I really enjoy running them. I always have my little gremlins that come up around them, but that's just part of being someone with a brain that's wired the way mine is. I think that's all I have. If you're interested in working with me, you can also reach out to me. Remember, sensitivity is nothing to apologize for. You have a right to be here. You matter. You're important. Your presence is important. You are making a difference in the world. You have gifts to share and offer the world. You're creating memories with people. You have a right to take up space. You have a right to not agree with people. It's okay if not everybody gets you. It's okay if you don't like everybody and everybody doesn't like you. Who you are is just perfect for you. There's nothing wrong with you. And I'm just so happy that you're here. And I appreciate you. Have a blessed day.